Sunny Bona Bafundi and hi from the beautiful city of Durban in South Africa. My name is Maria Schult and today I want to show you a method of how quantum computers can enhance machine learning methods. And this is based on a concept called kernels. Kernels are similarity measures between two data points and in fact kernels give rise to a very, very big and quite abstract mathematical theory. It turns out that Quantum theory and kernel theory are very, very similar in their structure and we want to um, explore this and we want to like, um, we want to harvest this in order to build hybrid quantum classical quantum machine learning algorithms. Before we start, let's have a look at a couple of references. So the original ideas I'll be talking about have been published almost at the same time by myself and my co-author Nathan Kelleran and a group that is mainly based at IBM in New York. And um, there are a couple of related papers from the last couple of years. For example, Chatterjee and you have a paper on where they, not coming from quantum computing, but a little bit more from quantum mechanics, already note that there are similarities from kernel theory and quantum mechanics. Then we have Levin Trost, Mosini and Lloyd, who um, show how a quantum or a support vector machine can be quantized and run as uh, a quantum algorithm. And we have Stardemeyer and Schwab, who are not involved in quantum computing but show from like a more classical machine learning perspective how um, encoding data into quantum systems can be interpreted as feature maps. We will only touch upon the, the theory of kernel methods and if you want to learn more then just look at this like very good textbook by Schukop and Smaller on classical kernel methods and then finally a lot of the presentation will be based on um, schroeder Petrochona supervised learning with quantum So at the beginning I have a little warm-up for you, which is um, something based on the idea of kernel density estimation, just to get a feeling of, of what a kernel actually is, what these similarities are. Let's say we have given capital M data points, and I will in future also like always label the inputs of the data points X with a superscript that like, says which data point we are talking about. And for now we are just like one dimension in one dimensional space. Let's say now at each, data, um, at each data point we actually anchor a similarity measure, a kernel, which we always call kappa, and kappa takes the data point where it sits as the first input and as the second input any other data point. So basically it defines a similarity measure here between the first input or the first data vector and any other point. And you see the kernel I chose now is a Gaussian kernel, so that means that um, at a certain distance the kernel decays to zero here. And I can now like in every data point I can like anchor one of these kernels. And the idea of kernel density estimation is just to um, estimate the density of the probability distribution from which the data was actually drawn by just adding all these kernels together. So if I add all the Gaussian kernels here I see like this is my density distribution and you see the density is like larger where there are like more data points in those areas. Obviously, if I changed the shape of the kernel, for example, now I made the Gaussian a little bit wider, the density that gets estimated changes because the sum of these Gaussians give, give rise to a different overall shape. And um, but now I only like increase the width of the Gaussian, but I can also like obviously have completely different like similarity measures, a very different like base kernel. So this is now like more like in the sense of like deriving probability distributions, but I can also use this idea for a classifier. So let's say that my uh, half of my input data is red, is red dots of class one, and the other part is like class two of like blue dots. And now I have a new input that I want to classify. So I want to know is it blue or red. And now I actually like add kernels of all the red class together and the kernels of all the blue classes together and get two densities. Now I can decide what class my new input x tilde is in by just checking which density is higher. So in this case, the red density would sit here and the blue density curve would sit here. So I would probably guess that my data point is now uh, of the blue class. To put this into an equation, we can say we just like sum or we build our classifier and summing over all these kernels and multiplying each of the kernel with the label. So let's say blue class has label one and red class has label minus one this would weigh the label by whatever value the kernel has. What the sigma means is basically just um, a threshold function. So whatever is in this bracket here will just be like a real number and to put it towards a prediction, if it's rather class one or minus one, we have to kind of like do some thresholding. So sigma could be just like deciding to return one if the value is larger than zero and minus one otherwise.
Just to illustrate what I was talking about earlier, if this is our classifier and we call whatever is in the threshold function g of x tilde, um, let us say we only have two data points, two of class minus one and two of class one. What happens is that the prediction in the, in the um, threshold function looks like something like this. Now the following happens. Let's say this kernel here, so the similarity between the new input and the first data point and the second data point is very large. Let's say it's, for example, 5 and 2. And let's say the kernel between like the new data point and class 1 is very small. So let's say both of them are just 0.1, whatever this kernel function is. We get something like minus 7 plus 0.2. Now the threshold function decides, because this is a negative value, that I map this to class minus 1. And obviously if the kernel that compares class 1, so the blue class that we had before, with the new input, if this is like larger, then we would get a positive number here and we would decide our new input is in class, in the other class, in class 1 in this case. So now we've seen a little idea of how to like make a classifier out of this kernel measure, so out of similarity measures between data points. And obviously kernel methods um, are usually like a little bit more complicated and kernel methods that you probably know about are support vector machines and Gaussian processes. So I'm going to show you very briefly without actually explaining you anything about this classical machine learning methods, where kernel methods come in. So this is a bit of a section of those of you who know about those two methods. In terms of support vector machines, we have a classifier that is actually very similar to our like artificial little kernel classifier we built just now. And we see that there is an inner product between data points or training points and new inputs here, just as we had it before. And also when we train the model, we usually formulate a Lagrangian function that also has this inner product. And now an inner product is actually one form of a kernel because it measures similarities. So we could just replace this kernel by another kernel, which is called the kernel trick. So taking a model, like replacing one kernel by another kernel is called the kernel trick, and give the support vector machine a lot more power. And in fact, the version we had before is actually only allows the support vector machine to classify linearly separable data sets. But now if we use like some kernel that does something a little bit more interesting, we can actually do something a lot more interesting with support vector machines. Secondly, Gaussian processes, again, without going into the details, decide on like a prediction y tilde, or a certain prediction like a certain class y, given an input x tilde, um, according, like sampled from a certain, from a normal distribution. And in this normal distribution we find a lot of tensors, so these are matrices and vectors and this is a scalar. And in these tensors are actually kernels, so pairwise similarity measures. And this kernel, so which kernel you chose, um, has a very important influence on which functions are sampled in a Gaussian process, so how smooth the functions are. And this uh, matrix K is actually a little bit interesting because we'll talk about it later a bit more. It is a Gram matrix, or called the kernel Gram matrix, which has the pairwise kernels of all your data points from X1 to Xm as entries. Let us actually get a little bit into the definition of a kernel. So for those of you who are not um, very fond of mathematical definitions, I'll try to walk you through it, so no worries. Let's say x is a set, the input set. So this means that your input data comes from x. And most of you like think of this as like maybe higher dimensional vectors, so like real uh, collections of real numbers. But x could also be like a set of, for example, text documents or graphs and networks or something like that. So kernel methods are formulated in a very abstract theory um, to make them very powerful and deal with a lot of different data structures. So x is the input set. If we now have a function kappa that takes two of those inputs from the input set and maps it to a complex number. So we can define kernels also map into real numbers only, but let's for now like use the more formal definition like and map it to complex numbers. Such a function is called a kernel if the Gram matrix with these entries, which are the pairwise similarities of your data points, is positive sum indefinite. And um, since not everyone has to know what positive semi-definite matrices are, it's also like a very abstract concept. Let me just put this on here as, as a slide. Um, positive semi-definite matrices means that if I select m inputs from my like, input set and some arbitrary complex numbers, c1 to cm, this equality here or inequality has to hold. 
and we use this just now to show why um, inner products of feature vectors are actually kernels. So this is the second, like, a bit difficult mathematical part, and then it becomes a lot easier. Um, but this is now very important. So we have so far understood kernels as similarity measures on the input set. And kernel theory gives us a second angle, which becomes important for quantum mechanics. Let me actually show you the picture before, and then I go through the theory. The idea is the following. I've got my input space and my, like, um, input data points. And if I define a feature map that maps these inputs to two vectors in a so-called feature space, then inner products of those two vectors in feature space give rise to a kernel. So just to reinstate, you can read this, this um, diagram both ways. So either I've got a feature map that maps inputs into feature space, I take inner products of those feature vectors, and I get a kernel on my input space, or I can say I have already a kernel, and I'm guaranteed by mathematical theorems and by the, by the theory of kernel methods that there will be a feature map such that there is a feature space so that this equality holds. Um, one little detail that we see below, so this feature space that I was talking about in the theorem down here has to be a Hilbert space. What does this mean? So obviously for us, if we're like interested in quantum mechanics, immediately this rings a bell because quantum states also live in Hilbert space. But um, in this theorem, the role it plays is simply that a Hilbert space is an abstract space that has an inner product. So basically, if I don't say this is a Hilbert space, it's a bit awkward to write down this thing because a Hilbert space guarantees there is something that is an inner product. Basically, a Hilbert space is just a generalization of like your normal R3 or Rn. The proof of the theorem we just saw is so simple, it's just like two lines, so I'll just share it quickly with you. I showed you this horrible definition of kernels, and you saw there what is the definition of positive definiteness. And it said that a kernel, like kappa, is only a kernel if we can show this relation holds. So that means that given inputs, m inputs from the input set, and some complex numbers, we have to show that this inequality holds. Now, what we want to prove it is for a very specific kernel, and the kernel we want to show this for is basically the inner product of two feature vectors. So we want to show that this is always a kernel. This is only like two lines, so let me write this down quickly. By virtue of the bilinearity of the inner product, we can actually pull these coefficients and the sum into the inner product. So what we get is something like this. And now you can see that actually on the left side and on the right side of the inner product we have exactly the same uh, uh, term standing. So we can express this basically as the squared norm of the expression on both sides. And now from uh, your mathematics lecture you might know that a squared norm has the property of always being larger or equal to zero. So, what does that mean? The kernel formed by the inner product of two feature vectors is indeed a proper kernel as to our definition that we have before. Now, I want to like say very quickly why these feature maps actually become very important and also very important for machine learning. Um, it's a totally different way of thinking about uh, machine learning methods than, for example, neural networks where we extract features by like shrinking the feature space. In this case, we very often expand the feature space. Why is this interesting? Take this data set in my input space, so it's now two-dimensional data points, and this is the famous XOR problem. It's famous because uh, in the 50s or 60s, like perceptrons were shown that they cannot classify this data set correctly because they cannot separate the two data sets because they only have linear separation uh, decision boundaries. But now if I take my input and I simply just add another dimension, so my feature map basically adds my first input to the first input, my second input to the second input of the new space, but now it creates a third dimension which is the uh, product of the two inputs. What happens is that 
the data point that has only positive entries or only negative entries gets mapped to a positive uh, number and the data points with like mixed entries get, get mapped to negative numbers which means that in the third dimension my two data sets are actually separated and very simple classifiers can like classify this, this data set. So what I want to say with this as much as for example neural networks extract features we have like a different idea from kernel methods introduced here that map map inputs into a higher dimensional feature space where data becomes much easier to analyze. Obviously the, the task or the difficulty is now to find this feature map that separates for example classes and makes things a lot easier.